solenoid, I can put my fingers in the direction of the current of the coil, my thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field, and the direction of the magnetic field is what direction? How do we describe that? Towards the south. Yeah, the direction a north pole would move. So, if I have charged particles, charged particles are like what a current is. If I have a wire, and I have a current going through this wire, I have charged particles that are moving through this wire. A charged particle moving through a magnetic field experiences a force. It's going to be proportional to the charge. The more charge, the greater the force. The velocity, how fast it's moving, the faster it's moving, the greater the force. The strength of the magnetic field, the strength of the stronger the field, the greater the force. Now this formula right here, which we will want to know, can be rearranged for F. If I rearrange for F, what is the strength of a magnetic field? Well, it's the B, which is magnetic field strength, times Q, which is our charge, times V, which is the velocity, or how fast it's moving. Strength of a the magnetic force that a charged particle would feel. So we'll look at a charge moving through a magnetic field here. All preloaded, where did it go? Over here. There we go, and notice they have rearranged it like I did. QVB. I need to turn up some volume, so we'll stop that and try it again. Charges moving through a magnetic field experience a force. There is a right-hand rule to determine the direction of the force. Here is the equation that predicts the amount of magnetic force. Did they do it next for me? Yeah, I wanted you to accept that knowledge as I was shutting the door. For a force to exist, several conditions are required. First, there must be a magnetic field present. As they are going through this, it sounds like maybe a good test question. They are describing what is required before I'm going to have a force due to a magnetic field. First of all, I have to have a magnetic field. Second, there must be an electric charge. I've got to have a charge. If something is neutral, I'm not going to have a force. I've got to have a charge. Third, the charge must be moving through the magnetic field. A magnetic field does not act on a stationary charge. Oh, that was my question. So if I have a magnetic field right here, and I have an electron sitting right here, does it experience a magnetic force? No. No, it's not moving. If I move it, it experiences a magnetic force. No, those were the magnetic domains just help to jiggle them so that they rotate in line, or when I remove the magnetic field, so it just randomizes them. One more requirement that is not shown in this equation is the relative directions of the velocity and magnetic field. So I said, okay, now there's one more detail. I have a magnetic field, I have a charge. When I move it, I'm going to get a force if I move it in the right direction. Now this happens to be the North Pole. This is the South Pole. Which direction is the magnetic field? From north to south, it is going just like this in between these two poles right here. So, my magnetic field was this way. I moved my charge perpendicular to that field. It experienced a force. Let's keep listening. If the angle between V and B is 90 degrees, the force will be at its maximum possible value. As the angle between the two directions shrinks, so does the resulting force. If the two directions are parallel, the force goes to zero. Go ahead. So is that what kind of like torque? Like yes, yes, it's a relationship like that. So let me do my thing. This is a magnetic field that's going on. So here's my electron. If my electron is going perpendicular, I have maximum force it experiences. If I start going at an angle, then it's going to go at a less and less percentage, probably a sine or cosine relationship. If I'm going parallel, no force. I have to cut across the field lines. 
we sometimes say. If I cut across them, I feel a force. If I'm going with them, I don't feel any force. There is an annex. The precise oh. relationship can be determined with the sign of the angle between the two vectors. So there we go. If I get the sign of the angle, the sign of the angle is going to give me the opposite of that angle. So notice this opposite is the perpendicular component, is what it is. All right. For that for the moment. The direction of the magnetic force on a moving charge is always perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the velocity of the charge. So now we need to know what direction is that force acting. I had a magnetic field going like this. I had an electron going like this. Which way will it feel the force? Our right hand is going to be useful force. And also the right hand rule, another one can be used to find the direction of the magnetic force. Uh, before I do that last bullet point, let's look at our right hand rule right over here. Okay, here we go. Our right hands are coming up. We hold our fingers straight this time. Our fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, my thumb in the direction of my positive charge. This is like conventional current. And out of my palm is coming the magnetic force. So everything is perpendicular to each other. Magnetic field, perpendicular to the velocity, perpendicular to the force that we have. So what about my electron? Okay, I was going to do it here. I had my, where is my north? Right here. My north to south. So here goes my magnetic field. Now I moved my electron this way. So my conventional current is the opposite of that electron. Remember that. Your motion of the charge is the positive charge motion. So if they give me a negative charge, I have to go to the opposite. So which way will it feel a force? Feel a force. Ah, I wonder if that actually works. Let's see here. I found it too, and I posted it on the Google Classroom, the link. I don't know if you looked at it, here, but yeah, it's just really short, like two seconds. <laughs> but there it is, yeah, <laughs> floating inside that magnetic field. All right, yeah, I went looking for it. It's like, oh, it's right there. I don't know why I didn't find it the last time. <laughs> really, I looked up levitating frog and magnetic field that showed up too. Okay, so let's try this out here. I am going to make a complete circuit. It's really a short circuit because there's really no resistor on this thing. And I have it. Okay, here's the positive right out here. So if I'm following this, the positive is coming through my magnet right there. I'm going to try to get it coming through my back up right there. Yeah, I just want it to kind of balance there in the middle. Yeah, that's good enough. It's balancing there in the middle. So here comes my current. So my thumb is going to go in the direction of my current. Did I get my north on the right side? Nope. There we go. So I have my north right here. So here's my thumb in the direction of the current. Here's my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. Which way should the force be going? Up. I wonder if that wire will go up. So you go. Let me even do it a little better. Yeah, that doesn't happen very often. Let me try it again. Uh oh, it just flopped over. Here. Now I should go out, right? So if I have enough room for it to go out, yeah. you can see it being pushed, being pushed out. So there's the direction of my force that I am going to feel. Is that planned? No. Yeah, that was planned. So that I wonder, I knew the answer. A charge moving through a magnetic field will follow a circular path. 
draw a picture of that just a little bit. They have it in your book, I think. Yes, look on page 676. 676 in your book, that top left diagram over there, 3.2. What do the X's mean? Into the page. And that letter B is what's going into the page. What does B stand for? <laughs> Not this case. Magnetic field. That's my magnetic field, my B. So it's going into the page. So if you take your fingers and put them down into the page, and then we have a positive charge that's going up the page, so I can stick my thumb up the page. Which direction is that force going? Left. left. And if it keeps going left, that becomes a centripetal force, center-oriented force. Your thumb always goes conventional current direction, positive goes. Yes. Thumb always goes positive. So if you get negative, make sure you flip it around so it goes the right direction. Okay, so let's try this over here. <laughs> well, let's stick with our right hand. Let's not get all mixed up. 675, number two. It says, if an electron in an electron beam experiences a downward force of 2 times 10 to the negative 14 newtons. So I've got a force. 2.0 times 10 to the negative 14th newtons, and they said it was downward, so I'm going to draw an arrow down, that's the direction of my force, and it's from magnetism. And what was the particle that was moving downward? What did they say? An electron. So I'm going to remind myself that it was an electron. An electron has a negative charge. In fact, what is the charge of an electron? Coulombs. All right. So I know all of this so far from that first sentence. I'm not even done with the right first sentence. While traveling in a magnetic field that is 8.3 times 10 to the negative second t. What is that? What is t? What is the unit for Tesla? Magnetic force. What was it? 8.3 west. Okay. So I'm going to have to modify my picture a little bit. That is not down for me. So they are talking about a magnetic field. So here's my magnetic field B that is heading west. So if my electron is going down, I am actually going to have my Q, which is a negative, as an X, because it's going down into my page. And they want to know something. What is the direction and the magnitude of that velocity? Well, let's work on our direction first. So where do my fingers go? Direction of magnetic field. So my fingers are going this way. Where does my thumb go? Where? Out. Why is my thumb going out of the page? This is a negative charge that's going into the page. So what would a positive charge be doing? Out of the page. I've got to remember that. So where's my force? Down, Down the page. Or, since they call this west, if my velocity is here, then that is south. There's the answer for the direction. It is going to be heading south. Now I want to know the magnitude of it. Well, we have, this is the way I memorized it. I don't remember if that's the order that they had. BQV, all right. BVQ, yeah, same thing. Doesn't matter, we're just all multiplying them all together. So our B, 8.3 times 10 to the negative second, the velocity, that's what I don't know. I want to rearrange for that, don't I? We're trying to solve for the velocity. So we know the velocity is going to equal the force divided by magnetic field and the charge. 8.3 times 10 to the negative second Teslas. 
What did I just do? The wrong thing? Two <laughs> times 10 to the negative 14 newtons. I need my force on top. And our strength of the field, 8.3 times 10 to the negative second Teslas. And our charge was negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. I'm not going to take the time to get the wrong answer because we're limited on time. We have too many cool things we're going to talk about, so we have an answer somewhere. 1.5 times 10 to the sixth, you should get 1.5 times 10 to the 6, it would be meters per second, the velocity, and we already figured out, hey, it would be heading south. So don't let them catch you unawares with a negative charge. Turn that thumb in the right direction, the direction a positive is going to go, because they'll do that to you. Might do it on a test. Magnetic force on a current carrying conductor. Well, that's really what I demonstrated here. A current carrying wire and an external magnetic field undergoes a magnetic force because we have charges that are coming. And the force on a current carrying conductor perpendicular to a magnetic field is Bill. Magnetic force is strength of the magnetic field times current measured in amps, I, times the length of the wire in the magnetic field. So how long is the wire in the magnetic field? That's my L that I have right over there. Here. Is that the distance? Like how large the magnetic field actually is? Or the, the L is the length of the wire that's in the magnetic field. So right here, a wire, and this is really what I demonstrated. If I have my current and my thumb goes in the direction of the current, because that's always conventional current, my fingers go in the direction of my magnetic field. I've got those X's, so it's going in. So there's my magnetic force coming out of the palm of my hand. So that wire is going to move. Oh, and here's the length of the wire that was in the magnetic field. So my wire is going to move in this direction. Now, we had that moving out. What if I change the direction of my current? What's going to happen to that wire? Should move in. So where'd my switch go? Should move in. So here it goes. Well, I was trying to move in. Maybe if, I hung it, maybe if I hung it like this, it might move in a little better. There you go. You can see it moving in. Like a couple months also. Yeah, that's right. It, it right. That's exactly what happened. So let's look at two parallel current carrying wires. So let's say I have two wires that are like this. Both of them are carrying a current. They exert a force on one another. Equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. We'll figure out why that's going to happen. If the currents are in the same direction, they will attract each other. If the currents are in opposite direction, they will repel each other. We'll talk about loudspeakers next. Why? We're going to use our right hand and figure out why. So right here, we have two wires carrying current in the same direction. If I put my thumb in the direction of the current, my fingers are going to curl in the direction of the magnetic field. So there in blue is that magnetic field. Which direction is the magnetic field from this left wire moving right in between here? Which direction is the magnetic field right at this position where I'm pointing? Where is it? In to the board. In to the board. I'm going to draw a little X. That's the magnetic field right there. Now if I come over here, right hand, curls like this, what direction is the magnetic field in between those wires? Out of the board. A dot like this. Tell me what opposite poles of magnets do. They attract each other. What did they say is going to happen right here? They're going to attract each other. There's why they're going to attract each other. Right here, current going this way, in between, and again, I have a magnetic field X right there. It's going into it. Change the direction of my current, so it's coming down. My right hand curls right in between X again. It's going into the board. 
Well, these are both the same direction, the magnetic fields. What do light poles do? Repel each other. And so they are going to push each other away. So there goes the repelling. Okay, so your right-hand rule is going to tell you what's going to happen. Can you see what when you're taking the test, you're probably going to be doing a lot of this stuff. <laughs> All right? So you need to pay attention to your right-hand rules. Speakers, I mean, they said loudspeakers. Speakers use magnetic force to produce sound. What is a speaker made of? What's this thing on the back? That is a magnet. That's just a big old magnet. All right? There's this big old magnet. Now, right here, what do I have? What's that reddish color stuff? That's a coil of wire. And if you notice, this magnet has a hole, a ring, it's a hole right there, that that coil just fits right over so that the wire is in the magnetic field. The wire is in the magnetic field. Here we are. We've got wire in the magnetic field. In the entire length of the room. The entire length of it is inside the magnetic field, so I get an even stronger force is what's happening to it. So when I pass current through it, it is either going to be attracted or repelled because this magnet has is the magnetic field that it will either be attracted to or repelled from. So if I hook up this speaker, that one doesn't work. I'm taking apart. If I hook up this speaker to a direct current, let's see, I wanted to get my yellow on the red. Where'd my green wire go? Right over here. So, we'll hook this one up right there. We'll get our negative hooked up. Over here. And when I turn on power, let me turn it down a little bit. When I turn on power, it will either try to pull this coil into the magnet or push the coil away from the magnet. Right, David? times a second. I'm going to get, except it's going to be kind of rattly, I'm going to get a 60 hertz tone. There it is. That's how a speaker works. That's all a speaker it is. a magnetic field and those two magnetic fields interact. Do they attract or repel each other? And depending on how fast I do it, that's the notes. That's what a speaker is. So you can build a speaker. No big deal. All right. Well, maybe it'll take a little work. But. So, page 678, number four. Let's see what we have here. Magnetic force acting on a wire, 
that's perpendicular to a 1.5 Tesla uniform magnetic field. So our B, 1.5 Tesla, and we have a wire that's perpendicular. This formula only works when it's perpendicular because we want our wire to be perpendicular. That's the maximum force. What happens if my wire was parallel to that magnetic field? No force. Yeah, no force. Uh, is 4.4 Newton the force that it feels. 4.4 Newtons. Somebody keep reading that so I don't have to walk over to the current in the wires. 5.0? Yeah. Amps. What is the length of the wire? Okay, well, here we go. Magnetic force equals Uncle Bill. I mean, I don't know how you're going to remember it, but that's how I remember it. I don't have an Uncle Bill, but I do in physics class. So I want to know the length of the wire. No problem. We're just going to solve for L over here. We'll take the force divided by magnetic field and the current that comes through. We always have to make sure it's in the right units. So our force is in newtons. We're good to go. 4.4. Magnetic field is in teslas. We're good to go. 1.5. The current is in amps. 5. What's the answer? You can do that math while I'm trying to write it down. 44 percent two significant figures it looks like. So what is it? 0.59. What did we just find? Meters. Length. Length of the wire. 0.59 meters is what we just figured out. The length of our wire. Easy enough. A galvanometer is a very sensitive ammeter or it measures what? What is an ammeter measuring? Amps, which means the current. We're measuring the current. If we, I miss my galvanometer picture. Look in your book. Page 679. How a mechanical galvanometer or ammeter works. This one happens to be a multimeter. Um, but it's a mechanical one, not a digital one. I've got a digital one over there. How it works, if you look on that diagram here, I sure thought I had a picture, but that's not it. Oh, yeah, it is supposed to be it. <laughs> All right. No, it's not. They're showing a galvanometer, which is going to measure current. That's not what I wanted. So look at the picture in your book. If I have a current coming through that wire, a current goes through that coil, so let's think about that a minute. If I have a current going through a foil, coil, I have a magnetic force that goes with my thumb. If that magnetic force from the coil is in the presence of a magnetic field, it's going to be attracted one side, repelled from the other, depending on which way I put my current. And if I put a little spring on this coil so that it has some resistance, well, the stronger the current, the stronger the force. It'll push it against that spring farther. A little weaker current, it won't push as much. You've got a meter that measures how strong the current is. I'm going to pass around this and just look in the front here, and you can see it's exactly that. You're going to see what that picture is on page 679. There. You can see the coil wrapped around in between two magnets. So you can make yourself a galvanometer. Literally, that's all it takes, a magnetic field and a coil of wire that comes through. All right, moving on to section one of chapter 20, and I hope to get to some, a couple of videos because this plays right into, chapter 19 plays right into the northern lights. And why do we have northern lights? And what's going on with the northern lights? So I want to get to that. It's charged particles from the sun in the Earth's magnetic field. And the Earth's magnetic field, if you think of the globe here, it's concentrated at the poles, both the North Pole and the South Pole, if you think of those magnetic field lines coming around a magnet. And so that's why you see the northern lights or the southern lights, aurora borealis and aurora australis, Depending on how far north you go, the stronger those northern lights are because you have more and more charged particles concentrated. Now, we have to mix it with some stuff that you don't know yet. The colors we get out of the northern lights depends on the, um, the, what the atmosphere is made up of, namely nitrogen and oxygen. 
and it's the energy levels, those charged particles, when they change between energy levels, they give off energy. And just like sound, sound, depending on the frequency, is the notes you hear. Light, depending on the frequency, is the color we see. Yep. And so it's a certain amount of energy that it gives off. A certain frequency matches with that, and that's northern lights. But I hope to show you a video of it. All right. Electromagnetic induction, chapter 20. The process of creating a current. So I've been creating some currents here by just plugging something into the wall and I have my power supply. But how do I create a current? How does the power plant, plant create that current that comes over the wires and through here and up into my machine? Electromagnetic induction. We need changing magnetic fields. If I have a change in the magnetic flux, which is the flux is kind of the flow of magnetism, that idea, through a conductor, it will induce, create, an electric current in the conductor. The separation of charges by the magnetic force induces an EMF a source of voltage. So what is the idea? There's a better picture in your book again. Like in your book. I'm going to scan some of these and get them up on my page. Chapter 20, look at page 693 at the top. And let's look at that diagram for a moment. The gray bar is a wire. And so my blue dots are my magnetic field that is coming up. I want you to use your right hand, and I want you to put your fingers up, and notice we're moving that wire towards the right. So that wire will have both positive and negatives in it. So if I move my, put my thumb towards my right, you need to put it towards your right, then out of my palm is the force that will be felt. So that positive charge should be pushed down that wire out of your palm. And the negative gets pushed the opposite direction. So what they're saying here, we're separating charges. We're putting positives over here and negatives over here. I've got a potential difference, a voltage between the two. If I connect them with a wire, those positives will head to the negatives, or in a wire, it's going to be the negatives. They're going to head over towards the positive. I've got a current that flows. All it takes to create a voltage, a potential difference, is I need a magnetic field. That's what we have here. I have a magnetic field. I need some charges, so I'm going to take a wire. I've got charges in a wire. So right here are my charges. They're just in the copper wire. And then I need to move that wire in the presence of that magnetic field. Now let me ask you about relative motion for just a moment. All right, there's a magnet right there. So I've moved this wire in this magnetic field. What do you think if I move the magnetic field in a stationary wire? It's the same thing. I don't care which one you do. It's the same thing. I just need relative motion between those two things. Come up around the table. So I've got my mold on here. I am going to... Turn on the voltmeter, it's my most sensitive voltage setting, and I'm going to connect it to a coil of wire so that I've got lots of wire. Because the more wire I have, the stronger that I can get out of this. All right, be still. And I'm going to move these other things away from it. So what does that meter reading? Zero. Here is a magnet. That's a pretty strong magnet. Here is a magnet. And I am going to move this magnet. That's a magnetic field around. I'm going to move it into this coil. It's about to hit the table, but you probably saw it happen. Did you see what it did? Now let me just let it set right there still. Is there any current or voltage? No. Nothing. But now I'm going to pull it out. Did you see it go to 0.5? Now I'm going to push it. I'm not coordinated. I'm going to push it in. It went to about a positive 0.6. I'm going to pull it out. 
Ooh, it was a negative 1.2. Positive something, negative. I am generating electricity just by doing that. And moving a magnet in this. Bigger magnet, bigger coil, do it faster. I'm making electricity. I'm pushing it right now. Yeah, I'm pushing it right now. I'm just pushing it through the meter. That's all I'm doing right now. So all a power plant, you can have a seat. All a power plant does, an electrical power plant, is one thing. Well, three things. <laughs> in order to generate electricity. It has a magnetic field, it has a coil of wire, and it moves them. So it will spin either the magnet inside a coil, or it will spin a coil inside a magnet. We don't care which one happens. And the stronger those magnets are, and the more wire, and the faster it goes, the more electricity is generated. Yeah. Now, next time, we are going to get into our generators. That's what a generator is. It's just a big generator up out there. Yes, we can. It's very simple. And I'll show you next time we're going to get into generators, and you're going to see a little generator. It's simple. It's a coil of wire. It's a coil of wire in a magnetic field. That's all the generator is. Um, now, a generator is going to have a motor to spin one of those things, but that's all it's doing to generate electricity. It's literally spinning a coil in a magnetic field is usually how they do it. That's all it's doing. So right over here, let's follow with our right hand what's going on. Here I have a magnetic field. There's my north and there's my south. So here's my magnetic field going this direction. Now if this, this red arrow is showing the rotation, so let's look at this wire right over here. That wire is heading up. So, I need to have my velocity heading up like this on the right side here. Coming out of my palm is the fourth force. Sure enough, there it goes. There goes my current following that arrow coming out of my palm. Now, what's happening on the other side of this loop, this coil of wire? Well, it's heading down, sorry, when it's being spun. So, my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field for this part, I need to put my thumb down, the velocity. So it's pushing it out my palm that way, hey, in the same direction. So this, except I twist all my wires up, I have a direct current generator. It's called electromagnetic induction. That's going on right there. So how can I induce a current? Well, they're showing you three different scenarios. They're saying, all right, this is a loop of wire. This yellow box is supposed to be a loop of wire. And we know the blue dots are a magnetic field coming out. If I just move my coil in the presence of that magnetic field, I just slide it through. I was doing that here. I was just sliding it through. I'm going to generate a current, induce a current. Or I can, what they're showing here, is I angled it a little bit. Notice here was exactly, sorry, perpendicular, here's my coil, exactly perpendicular to my field. Here they're angling it a little bit. And if I slid it like that, more or less current? Less. Less current. Maximum current when I'm perpendicular here. Less current. If I slid it all the way so my coil is parallel, no current is going to be generated there. The angle between the magnetic field and the circuit is going to affect the induction how much it's going to. A change in the number of magnetic field lines will also induce a current. What are they saying there? I am going to keep my magnet stationary and the same. Here's a magnetic field. I am going to increase the strength of that magnetic field and decrease the strength of the magnetic field. The only thing moving is the change in strength that also will induce a current, create a current. So if I have an electromagnet that I can increase the strength, decrease the strength, or turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, 
I induce a current just by doing that. So let's go through their ways of inducing a current here. Oh, there's a galvanometer. We skipped over that one. Ways of inducing a current. This square wire represents a closed circuit. Current can be induced in a closed circuit in three ways. One method is to move the circuit into or out of a magnetic field. Note that the induced current is zero except when the circuit is entering or leaving the field. A second method is to rotate the circuit in the magnetic field, thereby changing the angle between the area of the circuit and the magnetic field. The third method is to change the intensity of the magnetic field itself. The induced current is proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic field intensity. So even when the magnetic field is dropping, I induce a current. Increasing, I induce a current. It doesn't matter which one it's doing, it's the rate of change. I could be dropping it or increasing it, it's how fast I'm doing it, that will be how much current I generate. Let's see what this one is before I move on. Okay, we're getting there. I've got another cool demo that I've got to get to here. <coughs> Lenz's Law, here it is. The magnetic field of the induced current. Now let's understand what they just said. If I induce a current in this coil, we already learned if there is a current in a coil, it has a magnetic field. The magnetic field of the induced current, I just created a magnetic field when I made a current in here, is in a direction to produce a field that opposes the change causing it. What that is saying is this. When I push this magnetic field into this coil, this coil generates its own magnetic field, opposing the motion against the motion. If I'm pushing it in, it's going to be pushing out. If I'm pulling my magnetic field out, it's going to be pulling me back in. This will be trying to repel. This will be trying to attract. Lenz's law is that concept. Lenz's law states that the magnetic field of an induced current opposes the change in the applied magnetic field. If the applied magnetic field is in motion, as in the case of a moving bar magnet, the induced magnetic field points in a direction opposite to the applied field's direction of motion. So those errors are opposing the When the motion of the applied field stops, the magnetic field of the induced current falls to zero because the value of the current is zero. When the motion of the applied field reverses direction, the induced magnetic field reverses direction as well. So Lenz's law is summarized by the induced magnetic field will oppose the motion of the magnetic field that caused it. Sometimes it will attract, sometimes it will repel, it will do whatever it needs to do to oppose the motion of the magnetic field causing it. Yes. So you know, can you go on to like get a giant magnet and explain to like a coil? Do you like create like near perpetual motion? No, because it works against itself. It stops itself. See, if I have my magnetic field, I mean, if I have my coil, and I have my magnet that's coming through, where it's going to generate a magnetic field here in the coil that's going to oppose my motion. So when this is trying to swing through, it's trying to slow it down. When it's trying to pull away, it's trying to pull it back. It will stop it fast. The opposite of perpetual motion is what's going The two coils go. Both coils will have the same effect that is going on. So, all right, let's look at Lenz's Law right over here. What is this? So let's see what this is. As soon as I can get my power cord, it'll slow down. Your pendulum will slow down real fast. All right. So what do I have right here besides what looks like something that will electrocute myself? Okay. What I have right here is a coil. Inside this coil are rods, metal rods, ferromagnetic rods. So if I put a current through here, it will strengthen the magnetic field 
right in this area because of those rods. If I put the current one way, if I put the current this way, then I have a magnetic field like this. If I do the current the other way, magnetic field like that. If I have a coil in the presence of a magnetic field, then, and there is motion or change of some sort, I will induce a current in this coil. This is just a little aluminum ring that carries electricity. And this induced magnetic field will do what to this magnetic field? Oppose the motion. Lenz's law. It will oppose the motion. So, what I am doing is I have connected it up to AC power. So I'm continually changing. I haven't turned it on yet. I'm continually changing my magnetic field. That's what I need. I need a change of some sort. I've got a changing magnetic field in this. So I don't have to try and move one thing. I'm letting the AC current do it for me. And if I turn this on, some of you weren't looking, we'll do it again. See the problems, they opposed each other. This magnetic field opposed this magnetic field. And it shot it off. So if I do two of them right here, it shoots it off a little higher. So if I do what's different about this one, what effect will that have? No current through this one. It's not a complete circuit. I can produce no current in this. I can produce a current in these. Produce no current in this. So what will happen? Nothing. Because it's not connected, the current is not connected. Now, feel the temperature. Room temperature, kind of cool, which is what it feels like, maybe room temperature.
of this one right here. It opposes the motion. Yeah, I'm not putting a current in this thing. It's not magnetism. There is no, there is no attraction. Oh, there's something in there. Where, where can I get away? Right? There's no attraction between copper and a magnet. Absolutely. Yep, and that's my magnet. Copper is not attracted to the magnetic force. Absolutely not. So the only time it becomes a magnet is when I've been doing the state current in it. Here it goes, real slowly. Falling through that thing, that's what it's long. It's going up. No, no, it's not. It's not magnetized. It will just drop like, oh. It will just drop like normal. <laughs> it got stuck in those little pads up there, and it got stuck when I did. So I've got to get my hand down there fast in order to keep that one. So there's a lens as well that is going on. Very last thing that we have, characteristic of an induced current, how strong is that induced current? It's found by this formula, the EMF. The negative means it's opposing the change. M stands for the number of coils, the number of loops that you have. Delta, this is the magnetic flux, divided by how much time, how quickly you are doing it. Now the magnetic flux, here you go, is found by cross-sectional area of your coil. So I'm going to take the cross-sectional area of my coil times the strength of the magnetic field times the cosine of the angle. I'm done. I'm sorry. I didn't get that there. But you got to see some cool things. I have to find that other little 